بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا وما بعد my dear brothers and sisters when I think about uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's blessed life and all the miracles that happened in his life uh, there are people who have actually collected all his miracles together in one place right all the uh, from the splitting of the moon and so on and so forth all kinds of miracles but in my view the biggest miracle of Rasulullah of course the Quran itself is one but the biggest miracle of Rasulullah was the creation of the Ummah was the creation of the brotherhood of faith that he was able to do in Medina if there was one single thing that spelled the difference between success and failure for the mission of Rasulullah it was his success in bringing together a completely disparate set of people who were diverse not in one way but in multiple ways and who were steeped in traditions and in uh, ways of thinking that reinforced their prejudices that reinforced their mutual hatred for one another that reinforced discrimination of all kinds he took this bunch of people and converted them into people who loved one another who respected one another and who literally in many cases gave their lives for somebody who in the past <coughs> in the days of the what we call the Yamal Jahiliya, the days of ignorance they would not have looked at that person they would not have touched that person and those persons those people became their dearest and closest friends now this is a, a incredible amazing um, miracle I, I keep using the term miracle uh, but to me, it's not just a miracle, but it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's itmamul hujjah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's completion of the argument in favor of the fact that it can be done. So if somebody today, looking at the world as we have it today, if somebody says that it is impossible to create mutual understanding, mutual respect, mutual love between white people and black people and brown people between uh, first world people and third world people between christians and hindus and muslims and and sikhs and jews and you name all the others atheists if somebody says it is impossible to bring all of these together as one i would say that is a lie that is wrong and if you need evidence of that, if you need proof of that, go to the life of Muhammad sallallahu and see how he did it. <coughs> so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi now brought <coughs> the Muhajirin himself included when they came to Medina. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa paired off one Muhajir with one Ansari. Again, as I mentioned yesterday, Hijrat is usually translated as migration, but please understand this was not migration in any sense that we might think of. These were not people who were going to Medina because they were looking for better jobs and in the hope of uh, starting new businesses because Medina is a bigger economy and uh, there is this and there is that. You know, the usual reasons today, for example, uh, in our modern time, when I say today, I don't mean 2022, I mean for the last several decades, um, why people from so-called third world countries 
have migrated uh, to so-called first world countries, to Europe and America primarily, uh, is for economic reasons, right? The majority of them, they came because uh, the life in these countries is uh, more comfortable, they are safer, there are more opportunities, a bigger economy, they are able to, uh, to do better than they would have done in their own home countries. So, this is the main reason, but this is not the reason why Rasulullah and the Sahaba came from Mecca to Medina. They came because they were driven out. They came because they had no option. They had no choice. Given an option, given a choice, they would have liked to remain in Mecca and make Mecca the center of the um, existence, the development and the propagation of Islam. But this was not the Mashiach of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was not the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they left Mecca and they came to Medina. As I said in my last class, they came completely destitute because the Meccan people, they confiscated their wealth, uh, they took away everything they had, movable, movable and immovable property, and uh, they, uh, many of them just barely escaped with their lives because the, the Meccans were even trying to kill them. And this includes Rasulullah and Abu Bakr Siddiq uh, because there was a price, there was a price of a hundred camels which was a massive amount of money in those days. Uh, there was a price on their heads, live or dead, right? Uh, wanted alive or dead. This was the, this is the kind of a poster if those, if those days, if there had been posters, they would have posted that. And not because they were criminals, not because they harmed anybody, but because, but, but because they wanted the best for everyone in the world. Right? This is a strange thing about, as far as Dawat al-Islam is concerned. Now, when they came to Medina, and <coughs> this is where the, the difference happens, which is that when these Ansaris, when these Muhajirun, when these people who came, and that's why I said, you know, we call them Muhajirun, we call them uh, migrants, we call them uh, people who migrated, uh, but effectively they were refugees. They were refugees. But very interestingly, when these refugees came to Medina, they did not live in refugee camps. Rasulullah paired one with one, one Ansari with one Muhajir, and the Muhajir, the Ansar took the Muslim, the Muhajir into his own home. They did not stay in refugee camps. They stayed with people. Now this is one of the very beautiful elements of uh, Islam and Islamic culture, which seems to have been lost because today, uh, take for example uh, orphanages, right? Uh, on a side note, I uh, remember somebody told me <coughs> that they, in India, uh, when uh, Maulana uh, Abul Kalam, uh, no, not Maulana uh, Abul Allah Maududi, Rahmatullahi, the uh, person who formed, uh, who, who is the founder of Jamaat Islami, uh, when Abul Allah Maududi was alive, um, sorry, this is redund redundancy in. Uh, in speaking. I don't know why we, we always, when he was alive, obviously he could not have done it if he was dead. Anyway, uh, so somebody went to Abu al and invited him to inaugurate a Yatim Khana, as we call it, uh, an orphanage uh, in, in, their, in their city. And Abu al Maududi Rahmatullahi refused. Uh, so they were uh, they were surprised and, and you know, maybe they were hurt or something. They said, you know, we are trying to do a good thing. Why would you oppose it? Why would you, why would you uh, refuse? He said, because to put orphans into a separate facility uh, uh, is like rejecting them and it only increases their feeling of loneliness and abandonment. They already, they have no parents. To stick them into a facility, no matter how uh, luxurious that might be and have them being cared for by paid servants who are the, the people in the, who take care of the inmates, uh, only enhances and increases their feeling of being lost and be uh, and having nobody in society. He said, this is not what Islam teaches us. Islam teaches us to take the orphan into your own home <coughs> and give the orphan a family. <coughs> the, or the orphan does not have his, his or her biological parents, but the adoptive parents become literally like parents. Obviously, there are rules of hijab and so on once the, once the orphans become uh, mature, but it gives them a feeling of being part of a family, which is what is lost. It's not because of food and, and, and shelter. What is really needed is that emotional support. 
which they will never get in an orphanage. Now the same thing happens if you take the refugees and stick them into a refugee camp, even if it's a five-star hotel, it is still a refugee camp. Very, very different from accepting them in your own home and treating them like your own brothers and sisters. It is completely, in today's world, you know, it is not even any use saying this because I don't think there's anybody who's willing to accept it. But these are the, some of the most beautiful things about Islam, which if we accepted, we would create a very, very beautiful society based on compassion and based on, on, on really, uh, you know, a, a true love for each other without discrimination. Now, Rasulullah also, some of the people he paired, and obviously not everybody because there wasn't that much, but some of the people he paired with were people who were so disparate and so completely <clears throat> different from each other that you would never believe that these two people could actually become brothers. But they were. Bilal bin Rabah was paired with one of the Ansari, with one of the Arab, uh, Arabs of uh, Al Ansar. Um, uh, Salman al Farsi, who was a, uh, was a Persian, and you know, among the Arabs, this was a matter of uh, they were uh, very chauvinistic as far as language was concerned. Uh, he was paired with uh, <coughs> with uh, Abu Darda al Ansari. <laughs> so people stayed with people, and families were were created. Um, the Ansar, like I mentioned yesterday, they, they were so beautiful and they shared everything they had so beautifully that a completely new sense of identity was formed based on a shared faith, not based on shared history, not based on shared bloodlines or lineage, but shared, his, shared belief. Um, some of the Sahaba um, who came to Medina, including people like uh, Abu Karas Siddiq and Sayyidina Omar and so on, Pradilano, um, Medina was, especially in some places, it was swampy and so on, so uh, it, had, um, it had some you know, ailments and I don't know, maybe they had malaria or something, but you know, they, they had, so people would get sick uh, and the Sahaba, some of them were very miserable and um, they yearned to go back to Makkah. Now when Rasulullah heard about this, he made dua and he prayed for the love of Medina to enter the hearts of the Muslims. He said, Allahumma habbab ilayna al-Madina ka hubbina Makkah aw ashad. He said, oh Allah, uh, let us make us love Medina like we loved Makkah uh, or even more, even more. Uh, he made dua for Baraka in Medina and he said, Oh Allah, double the blessing of Medina compared to what you have given to Makkah. And Alhamdulillah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala steadied the hearts of the believers. Medina is protected from ad Dajjal. There's a special reward uh, for being patient in the hardship of Medina. Uh, it had, as I said, it, had, it was swampy, it had fevers. It would get very cold in the winter. Um, and the Sahaba who came from uh, Makkah, they were not used to the uh, climate, so they got sick and they found it uh, difficult to live, uh, uh, to live there. And so, you know, they, they, some people sort of complained and so on. Uh, Rasulullah gave them, made this dua for them. Um, and uh, he said that if anyone is patient in the hardships of Medina, I will be his intercessor. I will be. I will make shafat for him uh, on the day of judgment. Rasulullah said, "Whoever can die in Medina, then let him die in Medina, because I will intercede for you on the day of judgment." I make dua that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala should take my life in Medina, and I make the same dua for any of you who would like that to happen to any of you, insha Allah. It is for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to do it in the in whichever way He <coughs> wants. Umar al-Khattab used to uh, pray uh, <coughs> that <coughs> he should get shahada in uh, Medina. Um, so his daughter, uh, Umar Hafsa, anha, 
uh, the wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and our mother, she one day said to him, "How is it? Do I, how you? How is? How is this going to happen? How is it possible? Uh, because you are you live in Medina, and you are asking for death in Medina for shahada in Medina to be to die as a shahid in Medina." She said, "All the wars and so on are being fought. Uh, you know." Hundreds of miles away, they fought in in Iraq and in uh, in Persia. Um, uh, you know, in the in Sham, not Iraq. There was no Iraq at that time. In in Sham and in uh, in Persia, uh, hundreds of miles away, uh, you are asking for shahada in Medina. Medina is the safest place on earth. I mean, how how are you going to get shahada in Medina? Sayyidina Umar Abdullah said, "I make dua. It is for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala." to accept this dua and if Allah accepts the dua then Allah will make it happen he is the one who has the power to make it happen and that's exactly what happened he was killed he was shaheed uh, while leading Salatul Fajr in Masjid al-Nabawi al-Sharif Rasulullah also said whoever plots against the people of Madinah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will dissolve that person and their plot <coughs> um, as salt <coughs> dissolves in water. <coughs> Madina is also sacred and so cutting of trees, killing animals, fighting and carrying arms in Madina is prohibited. It is also what is called the, as we, as we call it, it's the haram and uh, so we respect it for that reason. Now the Makkans, they continued with their plotting and scheming and they, plot, they plotted to uh, against Rasulullah because he was still in Madhya, they, 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 they plotted to imprison him or exile him and finally they plotted to kill him. So Abu Jah <coughs> recommended the last. He said, let us kill him. Now Billah. And he said that um, the way to do that, he said if any individual kills that kills him, then the Banu Hashim, the Banu Abdul Muttalib uh, will become the enemies of that person and that person's tribe. So he said the best thing to do is uh, to all the tribes to get together and kill him collectively so that the responsibility for his uh, murder, his blood, uh, will be distributed among all the clans. And so obviously the Banu Hashim cannot fight everyone, so they will ask for blood money which others can pay and that is matter will end. So this was uh, Abu Jahal's advice. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from such advisors and such advice. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Quran, Allah said, وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُوا بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُوا اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said which means, and remember when the disbelievers, uh, when these people of Mecca, uh, they plotted against you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to imprison you or to kill you uh, or to banish you from your home that is Bakka they were plotting and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too was planning and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners so this is the uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comforting Rasulullah sallallahu by um, this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a dua for hijrah. So when he was going to leave, he taught him this dua. This is one of the duas that you can make inshallah uh, when you are traveling. And it's one of those duas which is full of barakah for the traveler. Um, in uh, Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقُرْ رَبِّي أَدْخِلْنِي مُدْخَلَ صِدِقِهُ وَخْرِجْنِي مُخْرَجَ صِدِقِمْ وَجْعَلْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ سُلْطَانًا نَصِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, oh, and say, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my Rabb, let my entry, uh, and in this case was, was to the city of Madina, uh, be good, and likewise my exit, which was in this case from the city of Mecca, be good, and grant me from yourself, a supporting authority to help me or a firm sign or a proof. So this is uh, the dua which you can also make anytime when you are traveling insha'Allah. We come to the, uh, as I said, one of the, uh, or 
the greatest uh, event in uh, the seera of Rasulullah sallam uh, from which the calendar has been taken and that is the uh, the hijra of Rasulullah sallam Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha narrates she said one day at noon and uh, it's important when we uh, think about know uh, about this time because usually uh, among the Arabs uh, this was the time of uh, of siesta right so they had uh, uh, they had this uh, habit of siesta because it was the hottest time of the day um, so it was very unusual for anyone to be about out and about at this time so Sayyidah Asha Siddiqa Radhelana says that uh, one day at noon, uh, we saw a man approaching our house and uh, his face was covered. So he had a niqab across his face. When he came close, my father recognized him and uh, he said, Muhammad وسلم, will not come at this time unless it is important. He opened the door and he وسلم, entered the house and he said to my father, <coughs> please ask everyone to leave. Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, there is no one here except your family. So he's saying that, you know, your family is my family. Rasulullah accepted that. And he said, uh, then I, he said, uh, <coughs> I have been given permission to leave Makkah and make Hijrah. Abu Bakr radiallahu had tears in his eyes and he said, Alhamdulillah. And he said, can I be your companion? Can I, can I go with you? Rasulullah uh, said yes and Abu Bakr Siddiq Radhiallahu started weeping with happiness. Aisha Radhiallahu said this was the first time that I saw anybody weeping with joy. Uh, this is a, for her it was a uh, strange thing that her father is uh, so happy that he is actually weeping uh, with joy. It was a dangerous journey to say the least but Abu Bakr Radhiallahu was so happy that he was to be the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One of the lessons from here is that it is a question of how the company is more important than the destination. Um, even in, in our lives, uh, good companions will take us to a good destination. Right? Bad companions will take us to a bad destination. Sometimes the destination in your mind might be something good which you which you would have liked to. Uh, to go to but uh, because the companions were not good uh, you know it is possible that you might not uh, reach that destination so it is something which is uh, important to keep in mind uh, the importance of uh, good companions so Rasulullah asked Abu Bakr Siddiq uh, to get two camels ready Abu Bakr said to him I already have them ready, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi um, I had a feeling that your Rabb would uh, permit you to leave Makkah and so I prepared the camels. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said, I will pay for them. Abu Bakr Siddiq said, whatever it pleases you to do is acceptable to me. Now, this is the, again, there are so many things we learn uh, from Abu Bakr Siddiq uh, may Allah bless him and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases the rajat in Jannah this is the basic usul the rule of uh, hospitality to do what pleases the guest unfortunately we uh, in our uh, cultures uh, we impose on the guest uh, you know we mm, make life difficult for the guest it's like so when somebody comes for example you say no you have to eat you must eat with us if the guest said look I just ate so no you have to eat he said if I eat I will die he said no die but eat you know this is the kind of uh, we think this is being hospitable uh, we will take and put food into the plate of the guest uh, when the person is eating uh, forcing them to eat more than what they would normally have eaten and so on all of these are not rules of hospitality these are all Things where uh, it is you are imposing uh, on the guest. 
as one of my asatiza uh, one of my teachers used to say mehman nawazi ke maane hai ke mehman ki marzi chalai jaye mehman ki marzi ke mutabak kaam kiya jaye ye nahi ki aapki marzi zabardasti mehman pe chalai jaye iske maane mehman nawazi nahi hai he used to say that that hospitality doesn't mean uh, hospitality means that you do whatever you are doing according to the wish and the desire of the guest hospitality does not mean that you impose your you impose your will on the guest this is not hospitality so he said whatever it acts is is pleases you you want to pay alhamdulillah it is baraka for me i will take the money if you don't want to pay alhamdulillah this is my gift to you so he didn't say all of this but that's what he meant he said whatever it pleases you to do is acceptable to me and that's the real rule of hospitality Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then appointed Abu uh, Ali bin Abi Talib radhiyallahu anhu uh, to sleep on his bed and uh, the reason was not because he was afraid of uh, death uh, or he was afraid or he was putting uh, Sayyidina Ali in a place where uh, if they were attacked then Sayyidina Ali would be killed it is because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, had a lot of things which uh, the people have of makka had given him for safe keeping uh, and uh, he did not want to leave makka without returning the trusts to those people who had entrusted him with those things now imagine this is people who are his enemies these are people who are uh, who are who have been opposing him uh, yet those same people even though they opposed him they uh, still trusted him and they had given him things to keep and Sayyidina Ali Radhalanu he left him behind to uh, fulfill that trust give those things and then uh, for him to uh, come to uh, come with him to uh, uh, not come with him but come later on to Madina now as they left and uh, they were going sometimes Abu Bakr Radhalanu would walk uh, in front of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sometimes he would walk behind him. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, "Why are you doing this? Sometimes you are in the front, sometimes you are behind." Uh, Abu Bakr Radhiyallahu Anhu said, "Ya Rasulullah, uh, if I sense any danger in front, uh, then I walk in front, and if I sense any danger from the back, I walk behind you." And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Would you rather that harm happened uh, to you uh, rather than to me?" He said, "Ya Rasulullah, to me." this is what i would like if anything is to happen let it happen to me not to you then they reached al uh, agar al thawr there was a, a cave and if you see it's not a big massive cave or you know, like a whole cave system it's like a literally like sort of a hole in the in the hill and uh, they decided to take some take shelter there and spend the night uh, abu bakar radhiyallahu went inside uh, to check uh, to see if there are any Uh, you know anything harmful inside the cave um, and uh, he when he was satisfied he called us rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they took shelter in this cave uh, now the people had uh, the quraish had uh, put as i mentioned to you uh, a, a bounty on on uh, the heads of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his friend abu bakar as-siddiq radhiyallahu anhu and uh, so next morning uh, they came and i mean they, they literally sort of uh, caught up with them rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and abu bakar as-siddiq radhiyallahu anhu literally stayed in that cave for 3 days and uh, asma bin tabi bakar radhiyallahu anha uh, the daughter of abu bakar as-siddiq radhiyallahu anhu the older sister of sayyida aisha radhiyallahu anha she would bring them food and she would uh, you know highly dangerous because if she got caught uh, the she would be you know punished and uh, also if she came there and uh, if they followed her and tracked her they would meet them but alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected uh, on one instance there was a herd of sheep and she asked the shepherd to to, to walk the sheep over her footprints and he did that so she came and she uh, used to Uh, bring them food now during those days one day the quraish caught up with them and uh, 
they were standing, they came right up to the cave and Abu Bakr Siddiq could literally see their feet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, if they only look down, they will see us. Rasulullah said, uh, Oh Abu Bakr, what do you say about two, the third of whom is Allah? What do you say about two, the third of whom is Allah? Uh, and Rasulullah was completely at peace and uh, not afraid at all. Abu Bakr Siddiq said, that day, from that day, I was never afraid of anything. Many years later, uh, in the uh, at time of the of uh, the Ridda, uh, when the tribes were apostating, um, Rasulullah Abu Bakr Siddiq, the people saw Abu Bakr Siddiq uh, being completely calm. He is not not hassled and you know not bothered. And uh, he was sort of, you know, totally, uh, totally at peace. So they said to him, how is it possible that you are so completely at peace and you're not bothered? Uh, so he said, from the day when I was in the Ghar of Thaw, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent peace and tranquility on me and I've never been afraid since. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran later in Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, said uh, to the believers, Illa tansuruhu faqad nasarahu allahu iz akhrajahu alladhina kafaru thaniya sanayni iz huma fil ghari iz yakulu li sahibihi la tahzan inna allaha ma'ana fa anzala allahu sakinatahu alayhi wa ayyadahu bi junudin lam tarawha وَجَعَلَا كَلِمَةَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا كَفَرُوا الصُّفْلَ وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you help him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa or not, it doesn't matter. Because Allah already helped him. When the disbelievers drove him out, the second of two, when they, that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu were in the cave and he وسلم, said to his companion Abu Bakr do not be afraid do not be sad do not be afraid surely Allah is with us La tahzan inna Allah ma'ana. don't be sad don't be afraid surely Allah is with us then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his tranquility Then Allah sent down his sakina, his ka, his tranquility upon him and strengthened him with forces and angels that you did not see and made the word of those who disbelieved the lowermost while it was the word of Allah that became the uppermost and Allah is almighty always. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his help and protection and everything. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from displeasing.